If you've been paying any attention to the news, you would know by now that we are either in a recession or we're about to be in one. Now, if we are officially in a recession, which the textbook definition kind of agrees with, then there are a lot of strange things happening with our economy, especially since the feds actually want us in a recession. Now, if you're new here, my name's Hayden and I make weekly financial videos on how to make money, the stock market, and our current economy. But in today's video, we need to go over why the feds want a recession, because I'm pretty sure we all thought that recessions are not a good thing. So to start, we first need to understand exactly what a recession is, and the White House defines it as a real personal income minus government transfers, employment, various forms of real consumer spending, industrial production, and unemployment as a second factor. This, in simple terms, means that the typical recession will experience things like real GDP falling two consecutive quarters, unemployment ending up rising, employment usually slows, consumer spending falls, government debt increases, layoffs, low inflation, and smashing the like button for the YouTube algorithm, as doing this will help determine if we're actually in a recession today. With June inflation at 9.1%, we are still seeing the economy explode forward at full speed, sometimes uncontrollably, leading to price surges and a higher cost of living for the average consumer. Inflation is fundamentally caused by too much money chasing too few of goods, and I'm sure we can all agree with this since inflation in June resulted in things like food up 10%, gasoline up 60%, fuel oil up 100%, new vehicles up 11%, and shelter up 5.6%, and this is all year to date. Now the good news is we just got July inflation, which came out at 8.5%, which is a bigger slowdown than economists expected, and this is due to gas and airfare starting to cool off. A recession, on the other hand, would be the opposite, a much slower economy marked by a decline in economic activity, typically seeing prices fall and inflation dropping, which we're just starting starting to experience. So when you take all of those factors into consideration, you get a weird result. Now let's break this down a little further. We know that in today's economy, a lot of these factors have already happened, but at the same time, we've also seen a few do the opposite. The first odd phenomenon that usually wouldn't happen in a recession is that payrolls increased by 528,000 more than expected in July. The second thing we also saw is the unemployment rate at only three and a half percent, tied for the lowest rate since 1969. Wage growth even surged higher in July as average hourly earnings jumped 0.5% for the month and 5.2% from the same time a year ago. And to further add to the confusion, US household spending rose in June. Consumers boosted their seasonally adjusted spending by 1.1%, up from a revised 0.3% increase in May. You would usually correlate this with a growing and productive economy. However, these indicators are just not consistent with a typical recession. And the most notable reason for why this is happening is because the feds printed so much money during 2020 and just gave it to people while they stayed at home. And now that the markets are open, people are going absolutely crazy and spending all their money they had hoarded during the lockdown. This is what is causing the artificially high consumer spending and artificially high job growth. Of course, people are going to go back to work after they weren't allowed to do so for almost two years. And to me, these indicators are just skewed and need a few years to get back to a more reliable level before we decide to use them as to whether or not we're in a recession. Now, what I do know that is consistent with a recession is the fact that GDP did have two consecutive negative quarters. Layoffs are actually starting to begin, and inflation is starting to fall, and the price for homes, cars, and gas is all starting to cool off with it. Peloton laid off thousands of employees earlier this year. Real estate firm Remax slashed 17% of its workforce. Even traditionally layoff resistant companies like Netflix have made cuts as well. And now companies that saw a pandemic era boom like Shopify are cutting hundreds of jobs. Their reason has everything to do with business growth slowing while labor costs are increasing. Now the combination is causing American companies across a variety of industries to slash their workforce, which mainly fall in tech, real estate, and investment banking. So what's really going on? If we're not already in a recession, why on earth would the feds want us to be in one? Why wouldn't they be doing everything in their power to prevent one from happening to us? As you know, at the moment, we have indicators clearly saying we're in a recession and also clear indicators saying we're not. But the one thing that makes this time different is inflation, especially when inflation is coming in at 8.5%. This ultimately shows we have a high spending problem and a low inventory problem in the US, not a typical thing we 
see in a recession. So truly, we have a supply and demand imbalance. By raising interest rates, the central bank is hoping to achieve a soft landing in which it's able to tame rapid inflation without causing unemployment to rise or triggering a recession if we're not already in one. But the thing is, if we're not already in a recession, we will be by the time the feds regain control of the economy. This is because high inflation and low unemployment are both strong predictors of future recessions. In fact, since the 1950s, every time inflation had exceeded 4% and unemployment had been below 5%, the US economy has gone into a recession within two years. The way things are going right now, a recession will be very hard to avoid. The US simply cannot keep living with inflation at 8.5%. It would be devastating to our economy more than what we're experiencing now. And the good news is, though, that there's a good chance inflation will be lower by the end of the year. Now, this is obviously a good start, but the longer this takes to fix, the more people will end up in poverty. Now, an article published in July states adjusted for inflation, workers' hourly wages fell 1% during the month and are down 3.6% from a year ago. That's not a good pace to keep and something needs to give soon. At this point, it's really all up to the feds and the government to fix this mess they put us in. Now, this year, the feds have been trying to tackle inflation by raising interest rates and they've really had no success so far. Inflation is still at 8.5%. And we actually thought inflation had peaked in April when we fell from 8.5% to 8.3%. And as you guys know, we went right back up. And here we are again with the June inflation at 9.1% falling to 8.5% in July. The four rate hikes this year haven't been proven yet to work. We've seen a 25 basis point hike in March, an additional 50 basis point hike in May, 75 points in June, 75 points in July, and we'll most likely see another 75 points this month in August or September. Taking the benchmark federal funds rate to a range of three and a quarter to three and a half percent by the end of this year. This means with the feds jacking up interest rates at record speed, there's a good chance we may see inflation fall by the end of the year at the cost of the US being in a recession. But we won't know if inflation has peaked until we get August and September data. What will also happen is if inflation actually does go down by the end of the year, consumer spending and employment will also be falling as well by the end of the year into mid-2023. Unfortunately, this really is the only way the feds can regain control over inflation and bring us back to a world where it doesn't cost $5 a gallon for regular gas. Soon, you will start to see things slowly tighten if you haven't already, and the economy with all its consumers will start to feel the impact of higher interest rates. Of course, this won't happen overnight, but it is still something you need to pay attention to. It takes a few months for interest rates to really take effect, and mortgage rates, credit cards, personal loans, student loans, auto loans, and of course, business loans will grow higher in regards to interest. Overall, spending money and borrowing money will become much harder to do, maybe even disincentivizing people to do so entirely. And this is actually what the feds want. It's the only way inflation will come down and the only way manufacturers can catch up. And there is some silver lining in that. While higher interest rates might be bad for borrowers, they're actually great for anyone with a savings account. This is because the federal funds rate is also the benchmark for deposit account APYs. So that means when the FOMC raises rates, banks re react by increasing the amount you earn with deposit accounts. That means the APYs you earn on savings accounts, checking accounts, CDs, and money market accounts rises higher as well. And typically we see online savings account react more rapidly to Fed rate changes because there is much more competition among online banks for deposits. APYs offered by conventional brick and mortar banks respond much more slowly to rate increases and generally don't get very high even in the best of times. But the other good news is that recessions don't actually last long and they usually bring years of expansion after. According to Capital Group's analysis of 10 cycles since 1950, the average length of a recession is 11 months, although they have ranged from 8 months to 18 months over the period of analysis. There has also been 11 recessions since 1948, averaging out to about one recession every six years, which means recessions aren't all that uncommon. And what's even better is stocks can grow when the economy contracts. Although down markets sometimes coincides with recessions, stocks actually produce positive returns 
happens during seven of the 13 recessions since 1945. In fact, the S&P 500 index gained 3.68% on average during recessions. And what's even better is after almost every recession is followed by expansion, which can last on average around 67 months. So all in all, we can argue short term about whether or not we are in a recession or we aren't in a recession. But honestly, right now, it's just not important. What we do need to focus on is that one is inevitably coming if it's not already here. And when it does, we all need to take advantage of the opportunity it brings. So guys, with all that being said, if you want to learn more about what I'm investing in during this recession, make sure to stick around to the end of the video. Otherwise, make sure to smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm, turn on post notifications, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.